I want you to lean over to somebody nearby and I want you to say, it's time to level up. It's time to level up. It's time to level up, ladies and gentlemen. That's the title of the message today, uh, Leveling Up. And it's a call to Christian maturity. Uh, my son plays video games, and so he's very familiar with the term level up, but it's actually it's transcended that culture. And it's just a phrase that we use to talk about, I mean, I want to get better. I've got a buddy, he just became a Christian about a year ago, and, and often when we're talking, he's like, come on, man, teach me some stuff. I, I want to level up. I'm, I'm going for it. So I appreciate that zeal for growth and maturity. And that's what we're going to be talking about today as we look at Paul's uh, letter to the Ephesians. Now, uh, we're Bible people. If you're new here at Redeemer, we love God's Word. We love it. And so we're going to be chewing on it. We're just going to go right through. We're, we're in the middle of a series taking this letter to the Ephesians, going through it chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And Ephesians is one of my favorite letters. And if it's not one that you've read often, I would encourage you that it could be one that I'd say probably over the last 30 years that I may have read it more than any other letter in the New Testament because there's so much there, so much to chew on. I love the way that it communicates the gospel. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, wow. I love the prayers that Paul gives us in chapter one and chapter three that are so powerful. And so I hope that Ephesians will become a letter that you love, that you go back into, that you dig into year after year. The other part about Ephesians is that uh, that city and those Christians play a central role in the life of the early church. Paul spent three years ministering there because he said there was such a wide open door for ministry. And so Paul spent three years there. Then he sent Timothy to minister there. And when he writes to Timothy, he's writing while Timothy is in Ephesus. So it's a, it's a, and Jesus, when he speaks to the seven churches in Revelation, the Ephesian church is one of the churches that he addresses. So if this Ephesian church, these are people that we want to get to know because a lot of the Bible in the New Testament connects back to what's going on in the Ephesian church. And so that's one of the reasons that, that I love it. And as we read, Paul's, Paul's going to tell these folks that Here's what the gospel is, and now here's how you live your life in response to the gospel. You can divide the, the letter up into two halves, chapters one to three, which is where Paul gives us the gospel, where he celebrates who Jesus is. There's some amazing run-on sentences, which I think are actually free verse poetry. That's my opinion. Uh, but he just goes on and on about how good Jesus is. And then he says, and I've got to pray. I've got to get down on my knees when I think about you guys following Jesus. But when we end chapter three and we go into chapter four, if you look at the, the, the way that it starts there, you're going to see something that kind of cues us in. He says, therefore, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Pause there. Anytime as you're reading the Bible and you see the word therefore, you should ask yourself, What's it there for? <laughs> because it's often a, a key that the, the writer is saying, everything that's about to come is predicated on everything that I've said up to this point. And that's what Paul's doing here. This is a pivot point in the letter where Paul has been telling us, here's what the gospel is. Here's who you are in Christ. And if all that's true, now here's how you live. Therefore, and he says, walk which is, it's a, it's, an, it's a way to describe how you live your life. He says, walk in a manner worthy of your calling. That God, the, and that's just, you just got to pause and hang out there for a second. Your calling. Who has called you? It wasn't your mama calling you for dinner. It wasn't a teacher calling you down for talking. It wasn't a coach calling you to join the team. It was the God of the universe that called your name. Some of you can remember that moment very distinctly when God called you and how he's continuously calling us. Jesus is continuously calling us to himself. And so he says, oh man, in, in view of your calling, in light of your calling, walk in a manner worthy. Live a life in response to this incredible calling that you have on your life. And he says that I'm a prisoner of the Lord and I urge you, he's begging them, to walk in a manner worthy of this calling. And so that leads us to the question, well, what does it look like to walk in a manner worthy 
of the Lord. And, and that word worthy, it means weight. It's the weight or the value of something. And so if you would have the worth of uh, you know, a precious metal, gold or silver, you're gonna look at what's the weight of it. And so he's saying, let your life be worthy of your calling. Let your life be worthy of the price that Christ paid for your redemption. So if, and that's the greatest price ever, the blood of God, the blood of God poured out for us. So then if that's the weight, then how do we live? How do we live in response to that in a a way that that honors that? And so he's going to unpack it. What's it look like to walk a worthy life? And so he just starts unfolding in verse two, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Let's stop there. He said, this is what a worthy life looks like. And the first quality of a worthy life is humility. And it's interesting because in that time period, in that culture, they didn't, if you read the writings from that time period, you won't find the word humility used very often. And when they do, it's used in a negative sense to talk about, oh, I can't believe how humble that person is. Because in that culture, the culture that he's writing to, humility was not a virtue. Isn't that interesting? Even in our culture, is humility really a virtue? When I, watch, when I look at social media, I don't think so. Or you look at you know, the pre-games before a sports event. Humility is, not, is still not something that's held up in our culture. And yet Paul says, this is what you need to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. And when you think about who Jesus will, is and what he's like, it immediately brought me to Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, which is it's the only place in the Bible where Jesus tells you specifically what his heart is like. There's a wonderful book called Gentle and Lowly by Dane Ortland that unfolds that entire idea. It's the only place where Jesus says that. And Jesus says, I am gentle and lowly. Come and take my yoke. Come and follow me. And Jesus says, because I am humble. And it definitely reminds me of what Paul writes in Philippians chapter two, verses one through five. Listen to this. He says, if there's any encouragement in Christ, If there's any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So as we look to Jesus, as you walk with Jesus and follow him, one of the primary traits and the characteristics that he's going to cultivate in your life is humility. And and I love what Tim Keller says about humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. What? Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Oh, I'm just such a loser. It's thinking of yourself less, where you're just not even, it's not about me. I'm not so self-conscious. It's about the people around me, the people that I'm serving, the people that I'm loving and caring for. That's what walking in humility is. And he also says to to walk in gentleness, which gentleness is also, if you have an old King James, it's translated meekness is the other word. And and I think when you see that call, that that this is what it looks like to walk and follow Jesus, gentleness, and there's, there's meekness and humility, that when you walk with him, that meekness is not weakness. The only way that something can truly be gentle is if it actually has a lot of strength. Like you think of a giant Clydesdale horse, the big big guys clomping down the road, they have incredible strength. But if they've been trained well, they're also incredibly gentle. That's strength under control. And that's what God is calling us to, to walk worthy uh, in a manner worthy of him. And so that's a question. humility, gentleness. And then the next one that he gives us, he says that you would walk in patience, bearing with one another in love. 
And when I think of somebody not walking in patience, take a minute, who, think of your, a film or a book uh, of a person who does not walk in patience. I think, first of all, of Veruca Salt from the Willy Wonka story, who is this petulant, annoying little child. She's a bad egg. And finally, at the end, that, that ends up happening to her. But she's, I want it now. I, I, I love to hate Veruca Salt. Uh, she's definitely one of those. Or uh, if you've seen The Devil Wears Prada and the, the main character played by Glenn Close in that one also comes to mind as someone who has no patience. And yet, walking in a manner worthy of Jesus is to walk in patience with others. So how are you doing with that? How are you doing with your patience with others? Are you always so worried about your agenda and your time frame and getting what you want and, and you can check yourself because how do you act when you're in the line at the grocery store? <laughs> how do you act when you're making your way through traffic? What's going on? And that's going to be kind of an indicator of, yeah, this might be something that I need to grow in, in, uh, in patience. So uh, how, how are you with that? Um, and what comes to mind for me was when we were little kids, we had this record, it was called Music Machine, and it had the silliest Christian songs, and we'd play it over and over again because my parents didn't let us have any other records. And we'd listen, and it had a song about have patience, and it was sung by a snail as he was crawling along, and he'd say, have patience, have patience, because God is patient too. And when you think about how you sometimes treat others out of impatience, think about how God treats us with incredible patience, and it can help cultivate that fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And that's really what Paul's getting at when he's talking about this. He says, you know, that you'd go on to bear with one another in love, that you'd be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. And I love this because, and that's really one of the central ideas of this passage, is the unity of the church. Now, how do you know that? How do you know that? When you're reading Scripture, when you start seeing words being repeated over and over again, that's a good clue that, hey, this is the idea that he wants to get across. And so if you look down at verse four, if, you're, if you can mark your Bible, mark every time it says one. Here it goes. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord and one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. How many times did he use the word one? What do you think? Do you see it? You count it? Seven. Yeah, that's right. He's like seven times over and over and over again. What's he trying to get us to recognize? That we, there is one and we are in that. We are part of that. And so there's already a unity that we share when you become a believer and you are born again of the Spirit, which is what he's talking about here, that there is a unity that you have with other Christians I love this. Like if you've ever traveled or you've been and you've worshiped with Christians who um, have another primary language and you guys sing together, you may not even know any of the words, but you're like, man, I can feel it. we got the same spirit. Some of you guys have been on mission trips lately and you're like, man, this is, this is a real thing. I love meeting people. Sometimes you meet somebody and you know they're a Christian even before they say anything because there's, you just, their spirit bears witness with your spirit. And that is an incredible, that's just an, a, a beautiful way that unity is expressed in the body of Christ. And Paul says that I want you to be eager to maintain that unity. God has already created it. We're the ones that can mess it up. And so he challenges us to be eager to maintain the unity of the body. What are some things that would create disunity? Well, it'd be the opposite of those virtues that he was listing. The, the opposite of humility would be your pride. That's going to create disunity in our church. Uh, instead of gentleness, harshness. Instead of patience, that you would be impatient, that you're always in a hurry. And then, he's, and then finally, perfectionism or a lack of grace would, would keep you from being able to bear with one another in love. So think about those things. And maybe God is convicting you. Is it your pride? Could it be harshness? Is there impatience? Is there a perfectionism, a lack of grace? Because really what Paul's saying is, don't be a jerk. <laughs> All right, there, there's your takeaway. There's your application from this sermon is not to be a jerk. And, and it's interesting because when I, when I talk with my, uh, when, with my friends that knew me before I became a Christian, that was one of their comments. 
So you are a jerk. And as, but as God's spirit works in us, he, he begins to change us and transform us and we become different. So take that to heart though, that, that the, the application of the, the, the gospel and the spirit in your life is that we, we need to exhibit something new, a new life in us. And, and then we're putting our old life to death. But think about that. And, and, am I being a jerk? Uh, and then also he says, be eager to maintain the unity. And so what that means is if you, if you do have a, uh, an, a disagreement, an argument, a disconnect, or there's some kind of conflict that you have with others here in this church, here in this community, that the scripture encourages you to go quickly and be eager to say, hey, let's mend those fences. Let's bury this hatchet. Let's figure out what went, what went wrong. Let's have a conversation so that I'm not like always avoiding you when I'm walking through church or, you know, looking to the side. The Lord really cares about that. And so he says, be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit. So seven times he uses the word one over us. Now let's transition to verse seven. He says, recognize, he says, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And what you're going to see in this part is how there's an incredible diversity within the unity of the church. So we're going to see the unity of the church, and then we're also going to see the diversity. And Paul's doing what he's quoting from here uh, when he talks about how, how he descended and ascended is he's quoting from Psalm 68. So if you're taking notes and you want to look that up later, Psalm 68 is what Paul is referencing. And this is an incredible psalm. The church has used it for thousands of years to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And when you read back through Psalm 68, you're going to see it's a psalm of victory. And it's, David wrote it, and it's really all about a king who goes out and conquers his enemies, takes all the spoils of war, and then he brings them back to Jerusalem. And he's like, making it rain. <laughs> Everybody's excited because he's giving all, out all these gifts. And, and he says, and just like the king in his victory distributes all the spoils of war, Jesus is doing the same thing. When he descended, he became a man. And then when he ascended to heaven, that he gives these gifts to the body of Christ. And so we're going to see that it says, uh, as, he, as he gives these gifts, here's the gifts that he says, grace was given to each one. And I think that's an important takeaway for today is that Jesus has given every single person in this room at least one spiritual gift and generally lots of spiritual gifts because he's generous and he likes, he's a good guy. And so you have those things that have been given to you. And so one of the questions that you could have would be, well, what are they? And then how can I grow in them? How can I use those? And so that might be for you to say, hey, I want to go and study that and find out what those spiritual gifts are. Now, Paul talks about them in three different places. One here in, uh, in Ephesians 4, but also in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 and 14. There's a big conversation about that there. He also talks about them in Romans 12. And so those are some places that you could go if you wanted to read more about those spiritual gifts. But he says he gives those to the church. And, and in 1 Corinthians 12, he says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Why does God give us spiritual gifts? It's actually for the, it's not so, it's not for kicks and giggles and so I can get goosebumps and so I can, you know, uh, um, do something crazy or strange, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's honestly, it's for to build, to build others, for the common good. That's why he gives us those spiritual gifts. And so, he says that uh, use those for the common good. And one of the things that you might think about is to recognize, well, God's called me to some kind of ministry to use my gifts and to recognize, well, what is he giving me the grace to do? I had a friend who's a counselor and she wanted to help out with, the, uh, um, with, with uh, hurricane relief. And so she got up, she's like, I'm going to go help muck out some houses and, uh, and carry some stuff and uh, work with some different projects. And, and that's honestly really not in her wheelhouse. What she's really good at is, is counseling and talking with people and help them process. Because as you well know, so many people are totally shell-shocked um, by what they've gone through over the last couple of weeks. And so, uh, so she ended up setting up a group counseling session that she's offering 
for those people so that they can go and come and process. And that's, that's her gift. That's a grace that God has given her, a supernatural gifting. He's given you those same kind, different gifts that we need in the body of Christ. So he says, grace was given to each one. And then he unpacks it a little bit more. It says he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. All right, touch somebody near you and say, level up. I'll say it one more time. Level up. I love this. It, I love this verse about equipping the saints because that's my, that's my job is to help you, equip you, to help you guys level up. That's why as a staff here, uh, I think we, we, we think we've got the best jobs in the world because we get to walk with all of you and help you to level up, to get equipped. I love the idea of being equipped because I'm into camping and probably one of my favorite things is going to uh, Academy or Mahoney's or, one of, or REI if I'm in another city and getting gear and getting equipped and getting ready to go. I love it. And that's kind of this idea of being equipped for the work of ministry, that the work of those um, uh, apostles, pastors, and teachers, evangelists, that it is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And that's you guys. So that means every one of you has ministry that God has called you to do. Think back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, where it says, we're his workmanship created for good works that he prepared for us from before the foundations of the world. Every single one of you, God has good things for you to give your life to that will bring him glory, whatever they are, whether it's in the church or in the marketplace, in your neighborhood, wherever that God is going to use you in those places. And there's an expression by a, a, a pastor who's passed away now. His name is John Wimber. And I like this. He said, everybody plays. Everybody plays. When we think about who we are as a church, everybody plays. Everybody gets in on it. There's a spot for you. Nobody sits on the sidelines. We're an army and we need everybody. And I believe that God has given us everything that we need to accomplish the mission that he has for this church in this world. And it's in the people sitting around you and it's in you. So touch somebody and say, level up. Level up. Here we go. We're leveling up. We're leveling up. Um, the supernatural unity that God brings and the supernatural diversity that he brings leads us to supernatural maturity. This is the last idea for this passage. So we saw that we, there's unity, that's, uh, it's supernatural. We saw that there's diversity because you guys don't all have the same gifts. We're the body of Christ and some of you guys are eyeballs and some of you are toes and some of you are pinkies uh, and some of you are mustaches. And we need all of you, especially you mustaches. We need the whole body of Christ. So there's unity, there's diversity, and when those things are playing out well, there's maturity. There's unity, there's diversity, and it leads to maturity. And that's what he says in verse 14. We may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. So Paul's saying, we don't want any more arrested development. We don't want any more prolonged adolescence. We don't need any more babes in Christ. We need you to grow up, okay? Babies are cute when they're crawling around in their diapers. Adults are not cute when they're crawling around in their diapers, all right? God is calling us to maturity. He is calling us to grow. And some people may spend, may say, man, I've been a Christian for 30 years and yet not be very mature spiritually. And you say, well, what does spiritual maturity look like? I would say first and foremost, it means you are, you're becoming more and more like Jesus. That's what it is. It's not that you have more Bible knowledge. It's not that you're better at attending meetings. Uh, it's not that you're more polite, but it actually is that you are more and more like Jesus in every respect that you are being conformed to him. That's spiritual maturity. That's what Paul is calling them to. And he says, I don't want you to be like little children who get blown around and carried by every wind of doctrine. And as a, I've got two young children. As a dad, I like to mess with them and tell them stuff that's not true sometimes uh, when they ask me to, because they ask questions all the time. And sometimes you just get bored and tired of answering all those questions. And so you try to come up with some ridiculous example. You dads in the room know what I'm talking about. And it, 
and my son and I were, we were talking about this, this passage and this idea. And, and he was like, oh yeah, dad, it's like Calvin and Hobbes because Calvin's dad always gets, he's kind of sarcastic and snarky and Calvin always asks questions. It's an old comic strip if you've never read it. And there's, a, there's one that my son remembered where Calvin and his dad are sitting watching a sunset. And Calvin says, dad, why does the sky turn red as the sun sets? Well, son, it's all in the oxygen. It's in the atmosphere. It's, it's catching fire. Oh, and then Calvin says, well, where does the sun go when it sets? And his dad says, the sun sets in the west, in Arizona, actually, near Flagstaff. Oh, yes, that's why rocks are so red. Oh, well, don't the people get burned up? No, the sun goes out as it sets. That's why it's, a dark, it's so dark at night. Huh, doesn't the sun crush the whole state when it lands? <laughs> of course not, son. Hold a quarter up and see. The sun's just about the same size. Oh, I, I thought I read that the sun was really big. but well, you can't believe everything you read, I'm afraid. How does the sun rise in the east if it lands in Arizona each night? Oh, well, time for bed, son. And as he's going to bed, he says to his mom, I sure hope that someday I'm as smart as dad is. <laughs> blown about by every wind of doctrine. He's like hearing all these things. Uh, that's what a, You can do that to kids because they just don't know. I love messing with my kids because they haven't had enough life experience to know. But Paul's saying, you guys know. I want you to know more. I want you to grow. I want you to level up and embrace maturity and grow. And he says that you're not moved by every wind of doctrine, but that you know what is true and that you are rooted and grounded in it. That's why your reading, your personal reading of the Bible is so important because that is the primary way that you will grow and that you won't be blown around by every wind of doctrine. Even as we're teaching our kids and discipling them, one of the things I told them last week was, here's what I believe is true, but don't believe me just because I say it. I want you to be able to read it in the Bible and see it for yourself and know that it's true. And so that's one of the ways that we become mature and that we become stable in our maturity is through our study of the scripture. Paul also goes on to say these famous lines, and you probably want to mark this. He talks to them. He says that you would speak the truth in love. And part of, the way that, part of the way that we grow in maturity, we're in a community, we're unified by the Spirit, there's diversity in who we are and the gifts that God has given us, but what about the conversations that we are having with each other? Paul says that they should be characterized by two things that create a dynamic tension, speaking the truth, but speaking it in love. Because if you just speak love to somebody, chances are you're probably just enabling them, okay? If you just speak truth to somebody, you might be a jerk. <laughs> We've already talked about that. Because you can be right, but you can also be very wrong while you're being right. And so in the conversations that mature Christians have with one another, Paul is saying that there needs to be this divine synergy between love and truth. And I'll tell you this, if you don't love somebody, don't, don't go and start correcting them. Don't go and try to teach them something until you've worked that out in your heart that you say, I'm really, I care about their good. And that's why I want to have a conversation, a, a crucial conversation with them is because I really care deeply for them. So Paul calls us to that, to speak the truth in love so that it creates maturity. Because when you can speak the truth in the context of love to a person, they can receive it. And that's the best context for them to receive it and they can grow. But if you don't speak the truth, then we can't. And so Paul challenges us to do that. And when we do that, verse 16, he says, the whole body is joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly and it makes the body grow. We level up. We are building ourselves up in love. And that's where we close today this image of each part. God has placed you in the church. He's brought you into his body. And when you are doing what he's gifted you to do, being who you are, and you're connected with others, that they are going, you are going to grow and they are going to grow by what happens through those relationships. The kingdom, the fabric of the kingdom of God is relationships.
That's what it's made out of. And Paul is showing us how to have those healthy relationships as we walk in a manner worthy of his calling. And as we do that, that the body grows and it builds itself up in love. So this is a call today, a call to uh, unity, a call to embracing the diversity in the body of Christ, and then a call to maturity. And if I just left you there with saying, hey, be more unified, be more mature, come on, get with it, level up, then that would, that would not be such a good sermon because I'd just leave you to your own devices and your own bootstraps to try to pull yourself up with. And that's not what Paul does at all. Throughout the entire letter to the Ephesians, he is celebrating Christ and he is lifting up Jesus and he is saying, look to him experience him, the love of God in your hearts. And when you experience the presence of the tangible presence of Jesus in your life, when you look to him, then you will grow. You will experience unity. You will experience the gifts of the spirit flowing through your life and you will mature as you go deeper and deeper into the Lord, into him. And so that's where I wanna take us as we close out our time today. And so if you would, let's take a minute and let's pray together and go there. Lord, you invite us to come to you and say, all you are weary and burdened, come to me and find rest. That you would place uh, your yoke, your truth over our lives and lead us in how we walk. That we walk in your spirit and by the power of your spirit. So we thank you for that. And so, Lord, I pray right now, uh, as we are here, if, having heard your word, that you would give us the grace to respond to your word by coming to you. Lord, you are the head of the church, the head, and we're a part of your body. So we ask that you'd help us to be connected to you as we're connected to each other. And Lord, your fullness fills everything. And so we're asking that that fullness would fill us. Lord, your, your love is measureless. And so we pray that you would help us to experience the height and the depth of your love. And then it, we know that it will pour out of us. And so we will be able to love others well. So we thank you for that. And we thank you for your presence here in this room and in our lives right now. And we want to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. And so we ask you for the power to do that. Uh, the power that comes from looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen.